coming up on this edition of Contemplate. It says this at the, at the end. It says, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. As one having authority. When Jesus spoke, people listened. Like him or not, they listened. That was Pastor David Robinson from Axe Church in Camas, Washington. I'm Ron Hagelgans. Thanks for listening to another Contemplate podcast as Pastor David begins a series called Who is Jesus? Now, I think when we hear that question, we often don't give it a lot of thought because, well, we figure we already know who he is, and that's kind of that. But think about it. Who is Jesus really? Who was Jesus? Let's find out. Here's Pastor David with today's lesson recorded live at Axe Church. There is no name that brings the universe to attention like the name of Jesus Christ. We've all heard the name of Jesus, and so far we've all believed certain things about that name, about who he is. And and here's what we all know for sure, that there's really no argument about. Jesus changed the whole world. Jesus of Nazareth is the most prominent and influential figure in the last 2,000 years of human history. There's really no question about the impact and the influence of Jesus Christ. Think about, just for one second in your head, the year you were born. Some of you probably don't remember. You were very young. Um, but the year you were born, think of it in your, in your head. Here's the deal. That date tells you the number of years that you were born from the year that they believe Jesus was born, right? Our whole history is broken up and measured by the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It splits history in half before and after Jesus. And that's not all. We have a much more significant impact that Jesus has had on the world. Jesus changed the whole way that we look at life and the value of life, the way we look at everything. If you're a woman here today, congratulations. Um, it's a blessing to be a woman. And, uh, but there was a time when people didn't think that. In fact, when Jesus was around, women were not respected considered equal, considered important, considered uh, to be the same as men. And Jesus came in and said, no, I don't think so, culture. I don't think so, society. I don't think so, you who are, who are trying to divide people and put this one above that one and so on. No, no, no. I'm going to take women and I'm going to elevate them. I'm going to elevate women so that we understand that there is an equality of value between men and women. And that has shocked and changed the world for 2,000 years, such that we live in a place now where we're at least a lot closer than we were then. And those who follow Christ and are serious about that walk understand the value of women when he came from a culture that did not at all. Slavery. The, uh, the idea that a human being is made in the image and likeness of God and that no person is lower than any other person, who do you think that came from? Where do you think that the idea, all those who got rid of the slave, the chattel slave trade in the United States and Europe, they were Christians. They were believers like William Wilberforce, right? Like the Quakers and the Underground Railroad, like Dr. Martin Luther King, the Reverend Martin Luther King. These people, they were influenced by Christ and what he had to say. Okay, learning and, and, and understanding the, the whole world gets, is very serious about things like education, right? We all got to send, they make us send our kids to school or homeschool or do whatever we do these days. But see, that wasn't always the most important thing. There was a time when only sort of the elite people or the rich people would do that. But Jesus said, no, 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 you're made in the image and likeness of God. You have a mind and therefore you ought to learn. In fact, all the major universities that you've heard of, Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Princeton, these were all started by believers. Why? Because it was the Christians who believed that we ought to be learning, right? 
That was their mindset. Jesus changed the world about the way we think about learning and about teaching because Jesus wasn't just teaching men who are wealthy and who are whatever. He's teaching women. He's teaching children. He's saying, listen, life is valuable. Hospitals, the idea that you should care for the sick, we all take that for granted now. Like, of course, someone's sick, they should go to the, to the doctor, and the doctor should take care of someone that's sick. If you have a family member who's sick, you should take care of them. But, that, but, but you only believe that because of Jesus, whether you happen to trust him or not. See, back in the day, back in Rome, that's not the way they thought. They didn't think that way at all. In fact, one of the major things that caused Christianity to spread as it did was that there were a couple of plagues, diseases. Okay, you have to imagine these cities in Rome just full and uh, sewage running down the street. It was dirty. It smelled bad. But these were the cultural centers, right? They were full of people. And when a disease came, you could just imagine how quickly it would spread. And what would happen is people would get sick and their families and their friends or whatever, they'd take off to the countryside and leave the sick people there because they didn't want to get disease. Didn't matter if they were family. Didn't matter if they were friends. They left them there. But who went in? The Christians went into the cities. The believers who understood what Jesus was saying went into the cities and cared for these people. And the people outside were like, what in the world? Who are these people that they love so much? And they didn't just take care of the Christians. They took care of the pagans too. And they buried them when they didn't have any money. And they'd sit beside them and be with them as they passed away because they were sick. But they'd have somebody with them. And it wasn't their family. And it wasn't a friend. It was believers. Because Jesus brought the idea that people were valuable and they were important. And many of these Christians got the diseases and died. And they thought it was worth it because Jesus showed us that it's worth more than life to follow Christ. And that was unheard of. That was unthought of. There was an emperor in Rome who basically said, listen, these Christians, part of why this thing is spreading so fast, he was very serious about being a pagan, you know, and following these pagan gods. He said, well, one of the reasons it's spreading so fast is because they don't just love and care for their own people. They love and care for our people. Now, you pagan priests, go do stuff like that, and we'll sort of turn the tide back against this Christianity that's taking over the Roman Empire. The problem was there was nothing in the pagan philosophy or worldview that would have you go and be willing to die for other people. There was nothing in that worldview that would make you take care of the sick when it was safer to not. And so it didn't work. It didn't work. And as you probably are aware, Christianity was able to take over the Roman world. And of course, at this point, there's Christians all over the entire globe because the name of Jesus Christ makes everyone stand at attention one way or the other. See, back then, being humble, humility, which most of us think is a good thing. Oh, he's a humble guy. She's a humble girl. That's, that's good. That's a good thing to be humble. See, back then, being humble wasn't good. You, if you had accomplishments, you talked about them, right? You, you, you wrote them down. You talked about them. When you'd introduce yourself, you'd say, I'm so-and-so who's done such and such and this and that. Now, if we saw people do that, we'd be like, okay, brag much, right? Not our thing. Because we understand that humility is a virtue. It's a value, but it wasn't a virtue for them. The idea that you would humble yourself to someone who was your quote-unquote equal the way that they looked at it, they had their, their society was stratified, right? And so the idea that you would humble yourself to someone that's an equal or below, you might humble yourself in front of the emperor so they didn't kill you, but you would never humble yourself to your equal or somebody that was below you. But Jesus changed that. He's going in. He's God. He's the son of God, as he, as he claims, and he's going in. He's washing the feet of his disciples, taking the, the, the place of the lowest servant in the house, saying, no, 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 you want to be part of me, you've got to understand this. We humble ourselves. And it changed the way we view reality. Mercy and forgiveness instead of vengeance. All of these things have come from Jesus. But you know, the one that's, that's really affected me a lot in my life is the way that Jesus viewed children. Let's look at Matthew 19, 13 through 15. It says, Then little children were brought to him, that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. We think about children today as precious and special and important. But at the time that Jesus was living, that was not the case. 
They were not taking pictures of kids in a pumpkin or whatever you see on Facebook. You know, the little babies and the, I don't know, whatever's going on there, right? They didn't do that because they didn't care as much about children. In fact, as, as a Roman at the time, when they would have a child, they would take some time and decide whether they were going to keep that child. That's just the way they rolled, right? The child was born. They check it out. Does their, do the limbs work? Does this happen? Whatever. Is it, is it the right gender? Is it what I want? Is it this or that? And if it wasn't, there was no problem at all with taking that child and throwing it outside and let them die. So the child was either going to die from exposure, or if they were really lucky, they'd get picked up by somebody and made into a slave or a prostitute. So that was how they viewed children, and that was completely fine. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. When I was born, a long time ago, I had a club foot, okay? It was like this. My foot was like this. I was going to bring you the little cast that my mom had. But I called her, and she said she lost it. She clearly doesn't love me uh, to keep a keepsake like that. I'm like, she, she's like, well, I don't really know where it is. I'm like, what? It's my little club foot gas. <laughs> so precious. But my foot was like this. I can tell you right now, I would have been thrown out on the trash heap to die. No question. Cl- little club foot baby, I was deformed. Now, they just, now we put you in a little cast, my foot looks fine. I don't even know if it's this foot. I don't remember. I was really young. But I would have been destroyed if the worldview that predominated at the time had continued. Because Jesus changed the way that we look at children. And eventually, of course, this thing of exposing children went away. One of the things that was happening was Christians were going and taking these children that were, that were put outside and exposed and, and raising them. And eventually, it was outlawed in the Roman Empire to um, abort children or to, or to throw them outside like this and expose them. And so the Christians won. But you got to understand, in this case, I and maybe some of you are literally alive physically because of Jesus. Because you might not have made the cut. But because we look at it differently, and the reason we look at it differently is because of Jesus and the way that he talked about children. He has had an incredible influence. And continues to, I mean, you think about China, right? They don't even have normal letters there. You've seen the writing. I don't know what it says, right? It's very far away from the Middle East. It's very far away from us and so on. And yet Jesus is big in China. Big. There are 70 million Christians in China. It's possible that in China right now, today, on Sunday, that there will be more people worshiping in church than there are in the United States, which is considered this Christian, you know, place with lots and lots and lots of Christians. China has tons and tons of Christians that is growing. Even North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. You got to worship the Kims. You got to do all that kind of stuff. There are 400, 480,000 Christians in North Korea where you're just taking your life in your hand or at least going to prison, labor camp, whatever. Why is it? What is so impactful that Jesus has changed the world this way? How has he had this incredible effect on people. Well, he's had it from the beginning. At the end of the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount, um, which you'll find in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus is given this long, it's, it's where a lot of the teachings that you sort of recognize as coming from Jesus are sort of all in one sermon there in Matthew. Read it if you get a chance. Um, it's a page turner. It says this at the, at the end. It says, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. As one having authority. When Jesus spoke, people listened. Like him or not, they listened. Some fought against his teaching, and some loved it and followed him. But either way, there was no question that Jesus made an impact that the world stood at attention when Jesus spoke. And that to this day, it still does. And at the time, very few people got it. And I'm, I'm somewhat concerned that, that, that today, maybe, sometimes very few of us get it, what he was about, who he is. See, Jesus was seeking the lost. He lived as a servant, okay? They did not think of kings as servants. Jesus came and said, oh, I'm the king of everything. 
And yet, I live as a servant. He's serving the broken and the widow and the orphan and the sick and the oppressed and the sinner. Those under the oppression of darkness, the downtrodden. He came to push back the curse of the world and to declare the kingdom of God. And he did it in a way that nobody seemed to understand and that sometimes we still don't. He's going to people like Paul. Paul, who was out destroying Christians, putting them in prison, going to other cities to catch Christians and put them in prison, beat people down, doing the whole thing. He wanted to get rid of it. He was persecuting Jesus and everything his church stood for. That's the guy that Jesus comes to and says, hey, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul changes. He, Jesus changes Paul, draws Paul in, and changes his heart so much that Paul's willing to go through all kinds of trial and pain and difficulty just so he can serve Jesus because he loves him so much. How does that happen? How does Jesus change the world? I mean, he literally got rid of the ladders in society. You know how you, you are kind of living your life and, and what happens a lot of times or what you see with other people, I'm sure this isn't you, but what you see with other people is everybody's sort of trying to climb the ladder and feel important. And they either do that by kind of lifting themselves up, or sometimes it's almost sort of like they're trying to pull other people down below them on the ladder so they can feel like they're higher, but there's sort of this hierarchy that they sort of live in. These people are more important, oh, these people or those people or whatever, and, and I'm important because of whatever, and I'm better than this person because of whatever, and that whole thing. And Jesus just, he just threw that whole thing out, and he just turned the world upside down and said, no, 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 that's not how it works. Every one of you is amazingly valuable, amazingly important. Matthew 20, 25 to 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many people made in the image and likeness of God, everyone being amazingly valuable. This changed society, changed the world that you experience. You are experiencing the ripple effects of Jesus every day. Whether you realize it or not, whether you believe in him or not, you are living in a world that in so many ways honors you and, and thinks more highly of you because of Jesus. Jesus is the one who says, you mean something. If you're a child or a woman or you have issues, physical issues, health issues, or you're poor, you're different, Jesus is the one who says, no, 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 you mean something, and you mean something just as much as anybody else. He says we all mean something, no matter who you are, something incredible, something worth dying for. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, which he said was for you and me. And then he rose again, defeating death, and sin. So who is this Jesus? Who is this one who changed the world and turned it upside down? Well, Jesus asks his disciples this very question. Matthew 16, 13 through 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? So they said, well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now this question that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? This is the dominant question for every human being for the rest of the age. Condoleezza Rice says, there has never been a more important question in the history of humankind. Everybody understands it, from our politicians on both sides of the aisle, on every side of the aisle, 
to actors and musicians to the, the, the people making widgets and, and the lawyers and the doctors and the plumbers and the whoever. Everybody understands that there's not a more important question if they just think about it. There's not a more important question than who is Jesus? Do you all know how to make gold? I don't tell me we don't make gold. I know we don't make gold. We go find it, right? Or somebody goes and finds it. I don't go find it. People go and find it, right? But when they find it, it doesn't look like gold. It doesn't look like the shiny gold, not, not normally, that we have. And so they find it in the rock or in, or in the river or whatever, and they take it, and it's got a bunch of other stuff with it, right? And they've got to refine it. And they do that, they, they have like a foundry or something. I don't know. I've never done this, but they, you know, they, heat the, they heat it up real hot. And then uh, up to the top comes this stuff called dross, and they got to take the dross, and they got to get it out so that you're, you're back down to just the pure gold, all right? They got to refine that. They got to get the dross out. They got to do that whole thing. Now, we do that to get rid of those things that are obscuring the thing that we want to see. And so in the process of understanding Jesus, we got to walk through a process kind of like that. There's a lot of things that have been said about Jesus. Some of them are true. Some of them are false. There are a lot of things that have been said about Jesus that contradict each other, but they're gold in them hills. Somewhere in there, there's truth. And the way that we're going to be able to discover the truth is we've got to heat that foundry up, throw it in, and get rid of the dross. We've got to get rid of those things that that are keeping us from seeing what's true. we got to get rid of the improbable, the impossible, the things that just don't make sense so that we can, so we can mine down into that and try to get the gold. What's the truth about who is Jesus? And a lot of good thinkers and investigators, which we are called to be, if you're a believer, you understand this. Being made in the image and likeness of God means you're supposed to have the mind of Christ being transformed, thinking well. And so as we do that, as the Bereans, as we read when we were in Acts, the Bereans who would search the scriptures every day to see if the things that Paul was saying were true, we got to do that same thing. We got to put our, we got to put our minds to the task of asking the question, who is Jesus? And coming up with a serious and true answer to that. And to do that, we got to heat up that thinking, critical thinking forge. Right? And we got to sift the dross and get to the truth. Who is Jesus? Now, the first piece of dross that I want us to work on removing and answering the question, who is Jesus, is this. Here's claim number one Jesus of Nazareth never really existed at all. Jesus of Nazareth never really existed at all. Now, you'll see. Some atheists, some of sort of these internet infidel type guys, you go on your Reddit thing. I don't know if you guys use that, but you know, these guys that are typing on there, they'll say things like, Jesus never existed. You know, it's all a myth. It, it didn't really happen. There was no real Jesus. Okay. Um, and so you'll see that among sort of the internet crowd, but you won't see it among scholars. In fact, this claim is LOL. Um, that means something. I don't know. Um, my daughter uses it texting. Uh, here's a few quotes from some scholars on this issue, because we're just going to deal with this one quickly. Richard A. Burge says, There are those who argue that Jesus is a figment of the church's imagination, that there never was a Jesus at all. I have to say that I do not know any respectable, critical scholar who says that anymore. Michael Graham, In recent years, no serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus, or at any rate, very few. And they have not succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant evidence to the contrary. That's a very fancy way of saying no one believes that Jesus didn't exist. Uh, Bart Ehrman, who's written books about, uh, you know, basically not believing in the Bible or the authority of Scripture and so on, there's certainly no friend to Christianity, says, he certainly existed as virtually every competent scholar of antiquity, Christian or non-Christian, agrees based on clear and certain evidence. It is simply not up for realistic debate among those who have devoted their lives to the study of this time period and to the New Testament and to these documents and so on, regardless of their religious or non-religious biases or bents or whatever, they believe that Jesus existed, that he was a person, okay? So this theory does not hold up. 
You've been listening to Pastor David Robinson from Axe Church in Camas, Washington, with part one in our series, Who is Jesus? here on Contemplate. Now, on our next podcast, we'll look at something else many say about Jesus, that he was a good man and a good teacher, but not God. Ever heard that one? Well, once again, Pastor David will take us to God's Word for the truth, and you won't want to miss it. And now here's a special invitation. Thanks, Ron. This is Pastor David, and I'd like to invite you to join us this Sunday morning at Acts Church. We have great worship, great people, and I really hope to meet you this Sunday. And for directions and all the info you need, go to axcamus.org. Again, that's axcamus, camus with a C, axcamus.org, or call us at 360-885-9000. That's 360-885-9000. I'm Ron Hagelgans. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll check out part two of Who is Jesus with our teacher, Pastor David Robinson, here on Contemplate. Contemplate.